London was the last of the world's great cities to start climbing upwards. As the rubble of the Second World War was cleared away, new and taller buildings began to rise. In a few years, the look of London changed entirely, and nothing changed it more than the building that was eventually to dominate the skyline, the post office tower, tallest of them all. this tower grow from a hole in the ground. This is the first time I'll have been up. Oh, that is nice. Why does it have to be so high, anyway? I wonder what it's like up there in a thunderstorm. This sea is the best view in London. Think of being up there on a starry night, with all the world at your feet. Think of being stuck up there if the lifts broke down. Why did the post office decide to build a tower? Well, there are several answers to that one. But they're all based on the increase in the number of phone calls. In the late 40s, when most of the telephone exchanges were manual, the calls were handled by an army of 40,000 operators. Since those days, Britain's phone traffic has gone up three times over. To cope with it, more and more exchanges have been made automatic. Today, the whole field of telecommunications is expanding as never before. The scientists and engineers of the General Post Office have to tackle the problem of even greater traffic in the years to come. The work that was eventually to lead up to the building of the tower began in the mid-1950s. It started with the post office experts here at the Dollis Hill Research Station. They realized that a nationwide system of microwave radio links could be used to help carry the rapidly increasing number of trunk calls between London and other parts of the country. Slowly, stage by stage, the idea of the tower was worked out in miniature. This sort of work started the microwave network. By the 1970s, it will look like this. Putting it simply, microwaves carry radio signals of very, very short wavelength. Like light, they travel in straight lines. And like light, they're lost to view, or use as it were, by the curvature of the Earth's surface. So they're used over distances of only about 25 miles. And this is why the radio microwave beam does not go direct from London to Birmingham, say, but goes from one relay tower to another along the route. Naturally, the beam must not be obstructed. A hill or a tall building could cut it off. So the aerials must be placed high enough to clear any possible obstruction. Hence, the height of the London tower. It's high, right? More than 600 feet of it. Tallest building in Britain. More than 200 feet higher than St. Paul's. Its aerials beam the signal from station to station, like Stoken Church on the way to Bristol. The aerials that are high over London are Britain's main junction in the radio telecommunication system of today and of the future. For the tower has been built so that its capacity can be increased as it becomes necessary. The microwave aerial can transmit and receive a dozen or more carrier waves at the same time. Each carrier wave already carries up to 1800 telephone circuits and may eventually carry 2700 or even 3600. This gives the tower an enormous capacity. When fully developed, it could be used for something like 150,000 phone calls and four television circuits all at once. isn't it? It looks more like a modern minaret to me. 
Well, you know why. Has to be tall enough to clear the hills and buildings all round London. Simple when it's explained to you. Not so simple to get a good picture of it. Can't get it into one shot unless I lay it right back. Or to get on top of a building half a mile away. The tower was built in central London to save the huge cost of extending the radio links by cable from some distant suburb. The site chosen was just north of Soho in Howland Street. Here the museum telephone exchange had for years been used also as a television junction with cables linking it to the television stations. The tower's structure was designed by the Chief Architects Division of the Ministry of Public Building and Works and back in 1961 a start was made on the foundations. First a thin layer of concrete. Then on it was placed what amounts to an anti-friction gasket, a cushion of oil. Then came the basic raft of reinforced concrete. And on this float, the builders put up a concrete pyramid, 22 feet deep. That and the raft beneath it make up the foundations of the tower. Work then started on the first section of the tower, which is 35 feet wide at ground level and 2 feet thick. All tall buildings are to some extent flexible but because its aerials had to be spot on to beam the microwaves with accuracy, the tower had to be less flexible than an ordinary building. So at 80 feet from the ground, a bridge deck was built, linking the tower with the new exchange building. This acts as a collar, gripping it all in place. Yeah, how much higher is this thing going? Don't know that I'd like his job exactly. Long way to come down for your dinner, ain't it? It took five years to build the tower. The cost of the building, with the exchange building and all equipment, was about nine million pounds. Up near the summit is the cocktail lounge, and directly below it, one of the highest tower restaurants in Europe. The observation platforms have become a major tourist attraction. The aerials are housed on six main galleries, with the transmission apparatus floors directly beneath them, serviced by a network of cable shafts. The express lifts, travelling at a thousand feet a minute, service 30 of the 43 floors. Ever since the tower opened, the visitors for the public galleries have been a regular sight along the streets around the base, particularly at holiday times. More than a million people went to see the view during the first year of operation. Suddenly, London had a new place to go to, a new attraction for visitors from home and overseas. This was certainly something new. London had never had a view like this before. It became a must, like going to the zoo. But the public galleries are like the icing on the cake. Underneath them, the tower is a vital centre of the nation's telecommunications. Two hundred cables, many of them carrying four thousand or more circuits each, feed into the ground floor.
The amplifying station is on street level. You could say its job is to take and sort out the thousands of signals that go through the building at any one time. trunk test room is used for checking the thousands of selectors that route the calls automatically. Down the chain of repeater stations, the tower is linked to Goon Hilly in Cornwall, where signals are received from satellites. And Tulsford Hill in Kent, where Britain links with the Eurovision network. Signals like these converge onto the second floor of the main tower building. Here's the television control room with more than 120 television circuits capable of routing and rerouting programs, not just over internal networks, but between continents. Here the technicians are ready for anything. The tower buildings include a vast clearing house for trunk calls, where the number dialed is electronically examined and its route selected. The call is then passed on for the distant exchange to deal with. All the work is done by the equipment. The small staff is mainly on maintenance. This goes on all round the clock, but there will usually be more visitors up aloft than there will be technicians at work. For the tower itself is a technical world of its own. It has its own generators, its own ventilating plant, for it must have clean air. It is a masterpiece of electronic automation. Its 11 floors of transmission and radio equipment are seldom visited, except by inspecting technicians. Its aerial galleries are visited even less, except for the maintenance men. This is a lonely world, high over London. And above it all, over the restaurant, is the 40-foot mast, which could, if necessary, support a few more microwave aerials in the future. At present, it carries a storm-warning radar scanner to help in weather forecasting.
Day and night, it's all the same. The work goes on. Yet this, the tower of a million voices, is largely a silent place. Silent, that is, in the working areas. For the diners out, there's plenty to talk about. A luxury restaurant halfway to the clouds, on a revolving floor that commands the whole panorama of a city skyline, as the tables go round in a circle nearly three times every hour. Yes, it's a world of contrasts. The lift stops off at the 14th floor. A maintenance man has a job to do on some transmission apparatus. The lift carries on to the social world. Here the diners can meet over a drink, perched high over the galleries where the aerials direct the microwave signals with unerring precision. The bar is crowded. The early diners are eating. The background, the greatest. Here it would seem the sky is really the limit. In the staff canteen, nearly 30 floors down, the surroundings are different. It's less crowded here. Edinburgh Donaldson 2020. Will you hold on for room? Hello? Hello, Sydney. Get me a bet on the dogs. I want ten pounds to win on track five at Bellevue in the eight twenty. Oh, darling, I'm afraid I'm going to be late back to the office. The next DC train isn't until ten. Sorry, darling. No, I'll eat in town. Hello, Dryers. Rogers calling from New York. What's the price of United Shipmakers? I can buy one thousand at twenty fifty. Ici Moscou, ici Moscou. Nous désirons parler à Londres. London calling. This is London calling. London calling. London calling. Of course, in the present of future.